Parker Lewis Can't Lose came out at the right time. The cookie-cutter teen sitcoms of the era were definitely getting stale, and times were changing. Even though the series was heavily influenced by the John Hughes film Ferris Bueller's Day Off, Parker Lewis Can't Lose had a unique style all its own. I personally loved the series growing up, and I didn't realize how many people remember it as fondly as I do. Of course, this show wasn't for everyone, and for every Parker Lewis lover, there's a Parker Lewis hater as well. Welcome to the review. Today, we're taking a look back at the 1990 hit Fox series, Parker Lewis Can't Lose. Learn the origins of the show, what made it so different from shows of the era, the wacky characters involved, and the legacy left behind. Leave us a comment if you remember this show and whether you liked it or not. Gentlemen, synchronized swatches. On June 11, 1986, John Hughes released the movie Ferris Bueller's Day Off. The movie was massively successful, earning $70 million at the box office. So TV networks did what they usually do, turn a massively successful movie into a mediocre TV series. In fact, 1990 saw several of these bombs, like Uncle Buck, Parenthood, and a direct adaptation of Ferris Bueller's Day Off, which aired on NBC for one season. In 1987, CBS approached writer Clyde Phillips to create a show loosely based on Ferris Bueller's Day Off. Phillips, who had been working on television since 1978 and is most known today for the shows Dexter and Nurse Jackie, he took the bare bones, a popular suburban kid, a class bully, a vengeful principal, and a little sister determined to get her brother in trouble. The series, for whatever reason, was passed by CBS, which was actually a blessing in disguise because Phillips took it to Fox, and CBS went with Uncle Buck instead. We all know how well that went. Fox was still in its infancy and was known for airing shows a bit out of the box. This was a perfect situation for creators Clyde Phillips and Lawn Diamond because it gave them reasonable creative control over the show, something a major network would never do. Phillips and Diamond wanted to create something unique and different. Shot at Alexander Hamilton High School in Los Angeles, Parker Lewis played by Cor Nemec, who was most known in the late 80s for his appearances on Webster. And the miniseries I Know My First Name is Steven is a popular student at Santo Domingo High School. He's known for wearing colorful shirts and saying, not a problem. A running joke throughout the series was Parker's hairstyle comparison to Gumby. Each episode has some sort of scheme going on with his two sidekicks, Mikey, who's a rock and roll type that has a habit of referencing song lyrics in movies. He's often emotional and sensitive. I'm just the girl next door. Yeah, and I'm just the kid from the other side of the tracks. Oh my God. What? My life is a John Hughes movie. Ah, uh, look, how would you like to get into a recording studio for free? Are you kidding? Huh, this isn't John Hughes, it's Steven Spielberg. And Jerry, a nerd with the most amazing trench coat ever. Everything and anything can be found Velcroed inside. He's also known for addressing people formally. You've got grit. Careful, sir. I have a boo-boo there. In each episode, the trio concocts schemes against their main nemesis, Miss Musso. <laughs> it was only a matter of time, Lewis, before you got sloppy. Sloppy? You left fingerprints all over that videotape you used in your infantile little werewolf stunt. And her two lackeys, Frank and Parker's sister, Shelly. Miss Musso, played by Melanie Chartoff, most known as Dee Dee Pickles on Rugrats, is the no-nonsense principal of Santo Domingo, who puts all her effort into getting Parker expelled. She seems to have a magic thumb and constantly shatters the glass on her office door. How's it feel, Lewis? knowing you're going to be expelled. Frank Lemmer is Miss Musso's right-hand man, always clad in black and willing to do anything Miss Musso asks. Frank can also be summoned by Musso with a dog whistle and has the ability to teleport. Shelly, Parker's sister, often teams up with the pair to take down her brother for good. My brother's a dead man. Other characters include Parker's parents, Martin, played by Timothy Stack, and Judy, played by Mary Ellen Trainer. Time to do a Ferris Bueller. You know what? I gotta come clean. 
You guys saw right through me. I was gonna drop out, but this video, it really worked. You saved me. I'm the luckiest kid in the world. <laughs> Mental note, this Bueller guy's onto something. We also have Larry Kubiak, who when walking creates tremors. He loves to eat and is known to carry a brown bag lunch. He started the series as a bully, but evolved into a more likable character. There's also a wide array of one-off characters and celebrity cameos, which include Shannon Tweed, Barbara Billingsley, Ozzy Osbourne, and Robert Zemeckis, just to name a few. The beginning of each episode were presented with a different opening, followed by narration from Parker with a general theme and scheme of the episode. What made this show so different from anything else at the time was the use of cartoon-like sound and visual effects, which made it feel like a live-action cartoon, as well as breaking the fourth wall. Breaking the fourth wall was nothing new, but it was done here in a way with heavy narration that made you feel like you were right there with Parker and his buds, like a fly on the wall. The use of music in the series was also unique, especially during season one, where every scene had some sort of background music much like the classic cartoons. The use of pop culture references also made it feel like Santo Domingo existed in our world. Even though the show was wacky and surreal, each episode did have an underlying moral, like dating, dropping out of high school, video game addiction, and other team-related problems. Premiering Sunday, September 2nd on Fox, put Parker Lewis in direct competition with the massively popular 60 Minutes. On the surface, this may seem like a horrible idea, but Fox was strategic with this decision because their target viewing audience of ages 16 to 30 most likely didn't watch 60 Minutes anyways. Almost immediately, the media played up the competition between NBC's Ferris Bueller and Fox's Parker Lewis. But the two were not in direct competition because Ferris Bueller aired Mondays at 8.30 after The Fresh Prince of Bel-Air. Bueller! Cancel, Miss Musso. Lewis! The series got off to a slow start, but it wasn't long before a loyal viewing audience began to build. Not only was the series popular with its target viewing audience, it became popular with members of the film industry, including legendary film director Steven Spielberg. Season 2 brought some changes to the series. The surrealism was toned down a bit, and a new character was added, Nick Comstock, manager of the Atlas Diner, who often offers up sage advice. The Atlas Diner also became a new storyline location. Another big change came midway through season two. Parker got a steady girlfriend, Annie Sloan, which was another nod to Ferris Bueller's Day Off, played by Jennifer Guthrie, most known for General Hospital in a few episodes of 90210. For a lot of fans, episode 19 marks the beginning of the end. The trio no longer set up elaborate schemes or synchronized swatches. Miss Musso lost interest in busting Parker, and Frank Lemmer seemingly disappeared. More stories took place outside of school, and comedy was replaced with drama. With the massive success of 90210, Fox wanted the show to be more grown up and dramatic. Man, Park. I don't deserve a best friend like you. You get what you deserve, Mikey. This turn absolutely ruined what made the show as great as it was. This would be an early sign of retooling that led to the disastrous season three. Is your show called Cork Parker Lewis Can't Lose or just uh, Parker it's, Lewis? It's, it's just Parker Lewis this season. Yeah? Yeah. We've, we've uh, dropped the can't lose, and, but they're just maturing the characters a little bit. So uh, people can relate to them, I think, a little bit better. So people don't keep asking, why am I wearing that crazy shirt? Within the first few minutes of the first episode, viewers knew season three was going to be different. Parker's trademark hair and wacky shirt collection, gone. Jerry's trademark magic trench coat, gone. We're also informed that season three will take place in the summer. So the wacky high school hijinks, gone. The perfect way to destroy a series is to take away everything that viewers loved about it. Of course, Parker and his buds couldn't stay in high school forever and eventually would need to grow up. But they definitely could have squeezed a third season in with the tried and true formula of the previous. 
Most fans of the show have blocked season three out of their memory. For me, re-watching the season, I couldn't remember a single storyline. So I either stopped watching it, or there was just nothing memorable about it. Either way, the series left a lasting legacy behind, which inspired future television writers and creators, inspiring shows like Malcolm in the Middle and Scrubs. Every so often, Parker Lewis Can't Lose is brought up in pop culture. Whether it's an episode of Family Guy... Would he win in a fight with Batman? Well, Chris, think about what you're saying. Parker Lewis can't lose. Heretofore, Batman can suck on that. Suck on that. Or a Fallout Boy song. The show remains beloved by fans to this very day. As always, thanks for watching. Leave us a comment about the series. We would love to hear your thoughts. Also, for our regular viewers, would you like to see more of these in-depth looks at classic TV shows or not?